David Hume follows in the British empiricist tradition of Locke and Berkeley, the tradition being that all knowledge is ultimately derived based on justified by experience. Now, Hume agrees with that, but Hume thinks there's a fundamental problem with at least certain kind of knowledge about the external world, in particular knowledge about things that happen in the future or things that we haven't experienced at this point. That is, for us to have knowledge about things that we haven't experienced, what we have to be able to do is make an inference that from things that we've experienced in the past to things that we will experience in the future. And the question is, in order for us to make those inferences, we have to be justified in believing that the future is going to be like the past. And Hume thinks that there's a serious problem in trying to justify that. And the way to understand exactly, or a way to understand, the problem of induction over and above the argument that we went through, or I went through a formulation of the argument earlier, but let's just think about it conceptually. Look, on the left-hand side of the boxes you're looking at, you see two terms, a priori, a posteriori. And it divides up certain things that can be know that are knowable a priori, that is, that can be known or whose justification does not rely on experience. For, exa for example, you know, all bachelors are unmarried. If we know what a bachelor is, we can just we just know if we have the concept of a bachelor, we just by examining that concept we know that that's true. By contrast, some bachelors are playboys is something that we have to have experience. It's only knowable a posteriori, based on or after experience. That is, we have to come across a whole bunch of bachelors, unmarried people, who are playboys, or maybe player is the better, is the more modern term, but maybe that's even, I think my children use that, but maybe that one is passe, that one's no longer used also. So we see the difference between a priori and a posteriori. Now there's another distinction that's going to become important later on between analytic and synthetic. And the idea is if we go back, thinks all bachelors are unmarried is an example of a proposition that is analytic. When we think of analytic, it's by the analysis of concepts, of terms, or by definition, it's true. That is, if you know what a bachelor is, you know that all bachelors are unmarried. Another example of propositions that uh, many people put in that category, mathematics. That is, 1 plus 1 equals 2 doesn't tell us anything new. That is, 1 plus 1 doesn't tell us anything new that we didn't already know when we understood the concept of 2. That people, a lot of people, allege is an, is an analytic proposition. Analytic propositions usually are considered to be necessarily true, true by mad, by as a result of logic, mathematics, just because of the concepts. Synthetic propositions, by contrast, are things that are supposed to tell them, be meaningful, is, tell us things about the concept that is, are not contained in the definition. For example, some bachelors are mama's boys. I mean, that is something that proposition is synthetic. The idea is you would have to meet some bachelors who are live a sheltered lives and do whatever their mothers tell them. You'd have to meet guys like this in order to to be able to determine it's true. So the predicate, that is our mama's boys, tells us something else about some bachelors. Now, according to David Hume, or the way he seems to set up the problem, he likes to talk not about analytic or a priori, but rather about relations of ideas. Things are known as a result of relations of ideas. 
which if you think about it, kind of analytic fits in, or also a priori, that relations of ideas, you know the things are true just by looking at the idea, comparing one idea with another. That is, compare the idea of bachelor and unmarried. When you look at the two ideas, you can figure out by itself that the that bachelors are unmarried. Or if you look at the ideas of one plus one and the idea of two, we see that they're the same. So notice, so things like that are analytic. They're also a priori. And these are what David Hume calls relations of ideas. On the other hand, things, propositions like some bachelors are playboys, some bachelors are mama's boys. Those are things that, and David Hume would say, they're about real existent things. If you look at the, the other kind, the relations of ideas, you're not talking about, you're talking about the concept not things that have what David Hume likes to say, real existence. But real existence, the only way you know that is that they are matters of fact. By experience you find them out. And that tells you also that they're not synthetic, right? Because they tell you something new about the concept. One of the things they tell you is that the thing exists for things that are, you know, when we're talking about real existence. Um, and you know, they're not things that you, you can know a priori. They're usually things that you can know a posteriori. Now, David Hume also, the way he divides up the world, things that are synthetic, that is not true by definition, but true, are not, there's nothing that's knowable a priori and synthetic, and there's nothing that's analytic and a posteriori. The only two categories that are meaningful for David Hume are relations of ideas, matters of fact. That's where everything lines up. Now come the principle of induction. The past is like the future. And if you, we went through examples earlier uh, in the semester um, to see where, you know, to see what kinds of things we know based on this principle of induction, and it looks like a lot. All of our science, most of our empirical knowledge, that is, knowledge of the world, is based on that. So David Hume wants us to consider the principle of induction. Where does that fall? How could we be justified in believing that? Well, the first thing to think about is, could that be a relation of ideas? Could be true as a result of a relation of ideas? That is, And remember, the principle of induction tells us the future will be like the past. Well, Hume tells us any time we're talking about relations of ideas, the only way you can, the way you know them, or the way you can prove them, is because the negation of whatever it is is impossible. That is, these are what we call in modern terminology necessarily true. So anything like one plus one is two. It's impossible for one to for one plus one to equal anything but two. All bachelors are married. Uh, the concept of an unmarried bachelor, sorry, a married bachelor is a contradiction. Well, how about the principle of induction? Is the negation that is the negation of the future will be like the past? Is that possible? Is is the, the future the I mean the principle? Let's go back. The principle is that the future will be like the past. What we've experienced, or our future experience, will resemble the way things worked in the past. Well, is it conceivable that that won't happen? That is, the negation is true. Well, yeah. In fact, people write movies about it. They talk about it. They talk meaningfully about it. So it looks like we certainly can conceive 
that the future is not going to be like the past. So if we can know that the future is going to be like the past, it's not going to be because it's a relationship of ideas. Well, that only leaves one other possibility if we can justify the principle of induction at all, and that is that it's known through experience. But David Hume tells us, but guys, wait a second. We need this principle of induction for us to learn anything about matters of fact, anything about real existence, to know those kinds of things, to know anything about the unobserved cases, the cases we're going to observe in the future, we have to, ultimately, that's justified on our knowing that the future is going to be like the past. So, it can't be a matter of fact that justifies the principle of induction because the principle of induction is supposed to justify matters of fact. So, we're, and we end up in a circle. Okay, so the principle of induction can't be a matter of fact. That's not what... Well, those are the only two ways the principle of induction could ever be justified. Hence the problem of induction. It looks like empiricism has led us into abyss, the dark hole of skepticism. That is, we can't know a whole lot of things. Science certainly disappears because everything in science is based on the principle of induction, as is a very large percentage of the things that we know about the world that we live in. Not a happy consequence, the problem of induction. Now, as I mentioned, Hume's has an answer to it, not one that at least I find very satisfactory. That is what justifies our use of the principle of induction. Well, it's just that that's the way we think. Epistemology, I call that epistemology naturalized. Very popular theory today, uh, by the way. But I think it's really does not answer the question because the question, ultimate question is, how can you justify the principle of induction and say because it's it's been reliable but that's exactly the problem it's been reliable the question is not about whether it has been reliable in the past it's whether it will continue to be reliable in the future